Uh, good morning. Welcome to the fourth meeting of 2017 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Uh, before we move to the first item on the agenda, can I rem remind everyone to ensure their mobile, mobile, get the words out, mobile phones are on silent for the duration of the meeting. Um, the first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take items four, five and six in private today and to consider further evidence in the committee's reports on the draft climate change plan, dear management and our response to the uh, presiding officer's commission on parliamentary reform in private at future meetings. Are we all agreed? agreed. Okay, we are agreed. We move to agenda item two which is to hear further evidence on the Scottish Government's draft climate change plan, RPP3. The meeting represents the second of our oral evidence sessions, and we've been joined by a panel of stakeholders to discuss the overview of the plan and climate change governance. Can I welcome uh, Richard Dixon of Friends of the Earth Scotland, Dr Rachel Howe, uh, who's a lecturer in sustainable development uh, at the School of Social and Polit Political Science at the University of Edinburgh, Andy Kerr, uh, the Executive Director of the Edinburgh Centre for Carbon Innovation, and Fabrice Levecki, Climate and Energy Policy Officer for WWF Scotland. Um, as we have a lot to cover this morning, I'd appreciate if members and witnesses can keep their questions and answers as succinct as possible. We move immediately uh, to questions. Alexander Burnett. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning and welcome. Um, just a nice general question to uh, start off proceedings. Um, what benefits and challenges of a new approach um, do you see compared to RPP1 and RPP2? Uh, what contribution did you have to the scenarios in the Times models? And what, on the outcomes, what is your view of the outcomes uh, and particularly the variation in sector reductions? So it's a nice sort of general um, synopsis, please, of your view of the process. Richard Dixon. Thank you very much. How many hours have we got? <laughs> <laughs> you don't. <laughs> so, um, benefits, uh, I think we, you'll probably hear from all of us that we think the use of the Times model is a very good systematic approach. A model is only as good as the data you put into it and the, the way in which you treat the results, but it's a very good way to try and make the process more systematic and to make sure that departments which perhaps in the past have had little scrutiny on them have more scrutiny so that we try to make the distribution of effort more fair. And it is more fair, but it's still not very fair in terms of the outcomes. The challenge that that's brought, though, is that the Times model has taken a very long time to get up to speed and working and producing useful results, which has meant that some other parts of the process which were initially envisaged didn't happen. So there was initially a big plan for public consultation, major engagement with stakeholders, and almost none of that happened. So there was one big stakeholder event in December when most things were already decided. So because of the level of, of effort that had to go in to the Times model, that's held up a number, a number of other things. I think in terms of the overall output, the model has been useful, but of course the model has limitations. So for instance, it doesn't cover transport in any systematic and detailed way. It relies on Transport Scotland's model to feed numbers in. So it hasn't been able to say, why don't we do something more progressive? It's just basically be able to say, there'll be lots more cars, let's make them electric, that's lower carbon. So it doesn't say, let's get some of those people out of cars and get them to do something else. That's up to Transport Scotland to suggest or not suggest. So that's been, that's, to me, that's been one of the big limitations. Clearly, there have been trade-offs between ministers and cabinet secretaries, discussions at cabinet, as you would expect and as is right, but that the end product of that, of both the deficiencies of the transport side of the model and those discussions, is that some sectors have still got off much more lightly than others. So you'll see in my paper a graph which shows you that the big sectors, which include transport and agriculture, are actually going really slowly in terms of the 3% a year changes that we need over the next decade and a half, whereas some of the small sectors are doing lots more. So the big sectors where you would try to look for big gains, we haven't really found those. So to be fair, transport's done almost nothing since 1990 or since the bill was passed in 2009. So the fact that it's now doing something is progress, but I'd like to see it do a lot more. And I hope at the end of the committee's, well, full committee's scrutiny, those areas of transport and agriculture particularly will be tightened up. Okay. Rachel Howell. 
Uh, I haven't been working in Scotland for very long, so I haven't contributed to the scenarios. Um, I have been uh, paying attention to some of the stakeholder engagement processes that have fed into this, for example, the climate uh, conversations that have been held with uh, the general public. Um, I think one of the uh, benefits of uh, this plan is the use of the ISM model, which is um, a strong improvement over other models which focus uh, solely on rational choice. I'm glad to see that the model has um, given more understanding of how social and material processes uh, shape behaviour, but I don't think the model is being very, used very well, and I'm, I'm hoping I'll get a chance to come back to that when we discuss behaviour change more. Um, I think there's, in, in terms of outcomes uh, and the ambitions, I think that the ambitions in terms of behaviour change are very weak, and so, for example, some of the, the sectors have quite weak targets, like transport, because there isn't enough use of uh, behaviour change uh, ideas rather than simply technological focus. There's, there's too much focus um, on technological solutions, I think, in this plan. Um, and not enough recognition of how social and material factors really uh, shape behaviour and produce behaviour, don't just impact on choices. So there's too much focus on uh, individuals making um, choices that's deliberate choices and that doesn't reflect the whole of reality so I think uh, both the model and climate ch conversations have produced some interesting results that haven't been uh, fully taken up in the design of the plan okay. Fabrice Levesque so on the the benefits and challenges um, I echo uh, what Richard uh, Dixon said in terms of the times model has provided a much more robust initial approach in terms of defining sectoral envelopes, so attributing effort between the different sectors of the economy. Um, I think where the plan is weak, and that's partly because of this process they've been through, so we have a strong link between the envelopes and the policy outcomes. So the policy outcomes describe the physical changes that we need to see, so things like the number of electric vehicles or um, fabric efficiency improvements to buildings. So there's a strong link between the envelopes and those. There's a much weaker link between the policy outcomes and the actual policies that will bring them about. So, for example, um, looking at the plan, when we look at the policies, there's no information about the abatement that they produce or are expected to produce. So it's very hard to actually add up, try and add up all the policies and see if they equal the policy outcome and if that in turn equals the actual envelope for each sector. So that's a big problem with the credibility of the plan and I think um, a lot of focus went into the Times modelling, which was great, and unfortunately less effort has clearly gone into the part where we decide on the policies to actually deliver the changes we need to see. So that, I think, is one of the big challenges. I think it's led to a missed opportunity. I mean, it's disappointing to see that the Climate Change Plan was launched with no new policy. So the Committee on Climate Change have frequently, uh, repeatedly said to the Scottish Government, uh, we need uh, to hit future targets, we need to strengthen our policies, introduce new policies, particularly in the areas of heat, transport and agriculture. So it seems to me there's a huge missed opportunity here where when we add up all the uh, plans in the climate change plan, there is nothing new here for us to actually uh, consider and see that will actually bring about some of the changes that we need. So just to elaborate on that final point, the plan describes big technological and social changes and it's very hard to actually see if we add up all the policies, whether those will come about. So I think that's partly a result of the, the process that it's been through, and I think a key weakness is this final stage, the decisions between different departments and ministerial decisions about what kind of policies they could put into this plan. Okay. Andy Kerr. Um, thank you, Gavina. So my role um, really came about because of my, I'm a co-director of something called the Centre of Expertise on Climate Change, Climate Exchange, um, and we were heavily involved working with the analyst teams within the Scottish Government to support that, and that's a number of individual researchers across different institutions in Scotland. Uh, and I was also on the, the Times advisory group as it was being brought into being. Um, I would echo the, the points that have been made. I think the, in comparison with RPP1 and 2, there's been a degree of rigour of cross-sectoral analysis and coherence that was not in existence before. And it's clearly forced some very difficult conversations within by ministers um, because they've not been able to get out of the fact that you know, if you don't deliver emissions in one area, you're going to have to find it somewhere else. So I think that, that has been very powerful uh, and a very welcome um, change in, in, in approach. Um, if you look at the governance and the monitoring and evaluation, we'll come on to that later, I'm sure. 
again, I think a lot of the building blocks are now in place to take that forward, which is good. Um, I would also echo, though, some of the other points that inevitably this type of modelling framework ends up looking quite like a technocratic approach. And if we as a country are going to deliver 60% emission reductions plus by 2030 and onwards, you can't do that just on the technologies and uh, top-down Scottish Government approach. You actually have to build partnerships much more effectively with cities, with businesses and so on. And I suppose that's the thing that I'm, I'm missing here around the, the partnerships with stakeholders who are actually going to deliver this and um, some of the issues around behaviour change will pick up later. Mark Roscoe. Uh, thanks, Ed. Good morning. Um, can I ask you about the Times model itself? Because my understanding is that in other countries that have used Times, it's been hosted by academic uh, institutions and therefore, you know, the ability for stakeholders to get access to it and pl perhaps plug in their own assumptions or their own uh, policy interventions uh, has, has, been, has been there. But what's been your experience of engagement with the Times model in this setting, where it's clearly government that holds the model and is facilitating it? Fabrice Lovecki. I'd say the level of engagement we've had in terms of understanding the inputs, because the, the value of these energy models mostly rests on the assumptions that you make. So knowing these sort of assumptions about technology cost, uh, speed at which um, things are expected to happen. That's the kind of value of these exercises. And I'd say there's not been a great deal of information shared with the outside world um, from the Scottish Government in terms of the inputs that went into the model and the assumptions that have guided the, the outputs. I think that's most apparent in terms of what's in the climate change plan itself. Um, so we don't... The Times model has produced lots of information about um, expected uh, abatement from new building regulations, from... Uh, improvements to energy efficiency or the rollout of uh, renewable heat. Much of that information is within the Times model, but it's not inside the climate change plan. So I think there's still some way to go in terms of sharing that information, which would then make it much easier for, for us to look forward at kind of the, the changes that are expected and going back to the monitoring um, part of this, to look to see the, tra the trajectory of change that we need to have and then be able to actually monitor against progress. Because right now, the information is so vague uh, inside the climate change plan, it'd be very hard to come back to it in a year's time and see, you know, track what kind of progress we've made. So, so you think the information is there, it's in the model, and that policy options have been fed in. It's just not transparent how they've been rejected. Yeah. Andy Kerr and then Richard Dixon. Just, I mean, it's worth saying that the, the, the whole process of commissioning the Times model, making it stable, getting effective assumptions in, has, has obviously taken a huge amount of resources within the Scottish Government analytical team. So they haven't done the sort of stakeholder engagement that they had hoped to do. What we have been talking to them about is actually in, uh, working with them to bring some of the people who have been developing that model out on secondment to the universities to help the universities understand in detail all of these assumptions going forward um, so that the universities can start to play with it as, as, the, as happens in other countries and really test the assumptions, push it very hard and so on. So that seemed to be the next process and I, what I would hope is that this committee amongst others can actually um, hold the government to account on that. In other words, make sure that that does actually happen um, because the intention is there. I think it's fair to say they have um, struggled resource-wise to, to deliver what they wanted to do beforehand. Rachel Dixon. Um, so I agree with the previous comments and there was clearly a, a very good intention from the climate change team and the analysts to share more and time has run away with them and they haven't been able to do as much as they wanted. So they were at one point talking about producing an online calculator version of the tool so you would be able to plug in your own numbers. And that, that may still happen, but it hasn't, there hasn't been time. So that's frustrating that here we are at the committee discussing the draft plan and we don't have those numbers and we don't have that opportunity. So we can't, as Fabrice suggests, we can't question the assumptions that have gone in. But I think the bigger frustration for me is that we haven't seen the full outputs either. Even if we don't know all of the assumptions, we haven't seen the full outputs. So at the start of the plan, we have graphs which show what Scotland's emissions will be out to 2032, and it shows what they are by sector. Each sectoral chapter says we're aiming for this much, but each policy doesn't have a number attached. Clearly, Times has added up all those numbers to produce those overall graphs and overall numbers, but we're not being shown the numbers that are attached to each policy. And uh, as has been suggested, that makes it very hard for us to interrogate 
whether we think those are credible numbers, because we may look at them and think they're much too big or too small, too ambitious. We have secondary measures, so the number of electric vehicles or uh, other secondary measures, but we don't have the actual carbon numbers to be able to tell, do we think that's a credible policy that will actually deliver that much? And that means monitoring is very difficult from year to year. So uh, as um, has been said, I think the monitoring plan is well thought out, but without those numbers, it's very hard to be able to say, yes, in this year we did this much on this policy and that's the right amount because we don't know actually how much we should have done in terms of carbon numbers. Okay. Well, let's develop this, this issue about assumptions on policy. Uh, Dave Stewart. Yeah, thank you. Now, look at some of the bigger issues behind our assumptions. As you'll be aware, um, EU plays a crucial role in assumptions. In fact, seven policies in the draft plan refer to EU policy. Uh, clearly, you need to be the brands here to work out um, the detail about where we're going in Europe, but nevertheless could ask the panel what their thoughts are about making such large assumptions about an area which is, at the very least, a very fragile and delicate area of negotiation currently. Uh, Dr Dixon. I think that's exactly right, that there are some quite brave assumptions, and there's actually no real commentary in the plan on the, the danger of that assumption or why they've made that assumption. Uh, in some cases, of course, you can only assume, you can only put something in about um, that we'll work with Europe or try to work with Europe or something will come from Europe that will be helpful. But there should be some commentary on the risks involved in making those assumptions. And the key one for me is the transport sector. So obviously other committees will look at transport in detail, but as an illustration of how the plan is put together, the top policy, the first policy, so that means it's the biggest policy, the one that's supposed to do most, is about vehicle emission standards. And it says the EU and working with the EU and UK. So those standards come from the EU, current standards do, there are new ones being developed, and they will be developed by the EU. When we leave the EU, assuming that happens, that will be a discussion with the UK government. The UK government may talk to Donald Trump and ab adopt rather poor emission standards so that we can sell cars to America. So there are all sorts of scenarios where Scotland will be stuck with something which doesn't deliver at all on this policy. And we don't have the numbers to say how much it should deliver. We don't have... Uh, any commentary about what happens if that scenario comes about. So I think you're, you're right that the advocate. EU is... Sorry, to play devil's advocate, however, Mr Dixon, you've passed, some of you, a number of you have commented on the fact that um, the process has not been what you expect it to be because officials were so caught up in the detail of doing the, the volume of work they had to. Had they done that, that would have been even more problematic and we might have ended up with a document that was 360 pages long. Do you, would you accept that? Yes, of course. I think I was only looking for a bit of commentary to say that Brexit is a risk and here are the areas of vulnerability and here's a little bit of a sketch of a plan about what we might do if something goes in the wrong direction because we've left Europe. So I, I agree you could, you could spend ages doing all sorts of scenarios that may never happen, but a little bit of commentary would be helpful and it's a question again to ask the Minister when you have her in front of you what does Brexit mean and what's the contingency plan? Okay. Anyone else? Andy Kerr. I mean, I suppose the, the, the key issue, certainly from the government in the past, and RPP1 and 2 both captured this, is this issue around the, the traded sectors, the EU emissions trading scheme, mm -hmm. and the extent mm -hmm. to which, once we are out of Europe, are we still playing with those rules? And, and again, uh, uh, you know, it rather picks up the point that, that Richard has just made. Um, we can, I certainly agree that perhaps noting where there are critical assumptions in this ought to have been flagged and they're not, but equally at the moment there is such a lot of uncertainty in this space, it's difficult to know much beyond mm. saying we think it's a reasonable assumption that we're going to have to re retain European standards and European frameworks that our industry will have to operate mm. within. So that's particularly around the industry emissions. Mm. Thank you. One of, uh, one of the other large assumptions is about carbon capture and storage. And my colleague, Mark Ruskell, may wish to come in on this point as well. I mean, uh, the, obviously, you're all aware that the UK government effectively ceased the billion pound funding for carbon capture and storage. Um, whilst carbon capture storage is an excellent initiative, if there's clearly loss of that massive amount of funding, where is it going to happen in Scotland? And therefore, how are we going to contribute to plan? Andy Kerr? Mm. I think um, one of my big concerns with the, the assumptions here is around the, the electricity sector and the assumption that by 2027 we're going to have negative emissions, which implies both that we've got biomass, bioenergy, which is being carbon captured and stored within 10 years, to me, is, is an incredible assumption. Um, I have to say, we need to be aware, of course, that Scotland is not 
where, if you like, the technology innovation learning rates, in other words, bringing the cost down, is actually going to happen, apart from one or two sectors, for example, in marine energy. In most of the places, it depends entirely on what happens in other parts of the world. Um, and so whether CCS becomes commercially viable within 10 to 15 years or 10 years for this plan to work depends on whether it has actually got that learning rate the, and the cost reductions from uh, work that is being done elsewhere. Um, I have my doubts on that. And I think if, if you look at where the major cost reductions are going ahead around the world in different markets, they're still in solar, onshore wind, battery storage, smart grids. That's actually where I would expect to see the real benefits. I'm not seeing that yet. We're not seeing that yet in CCS. So I think that's a rather um, optimistic assumption myself. Um, mm -hmm. and, and obviously the Times model is driving that as being the only way it can try and find the least cost path. But that depends on having a bunch of assumptions in there which says it's going to be commercially viable by the late 2020s, mm -hmm. which to me is uh, unlikely. So. For Bruce Slovakia. I don't share the same reservations. Uh, the CCS um, is quite surprising that it generates negative emissions. So um, the plan relies on CCS and also relies on CCS to actually extract emissions from the atmosphere, um, which would be interesting to find out exactly why that's um, happened in the, in the model. It's certainly far faster than um, bodies like the Quintian Climate Change would recommend. And it seems to suggest to me that other sectors Essentially, going very hard on electricity and getting negative emissions means you can do less in other sectors. So CCS is a concern from, from that point of view. I, I think there's a broader point as well in terms of uh, going back to kind of the credibility gap with the climate change plan, which is uh, CCS, electric vehicles, these are kind of external changes um, that are expected to happen in the, in the wider world and that will come in and we can sort of ride off the right off the back of those. Um, so the climate change plan rests a lot on these external technology breakthroughs, and there's very little uh, new initiative to make sure that those technology um, innovations take place in Scotland, that Scotland is able to reap the, some of the benefits of those as well. So again, I'd say CCS, unfortunately, is both, uh, it looks like it's given a free pass to some sectors. Uh, it's also uh, a case where we're relying on external changes, where we could actually be doing far more on the in the technologies that we actually are mm. able to do now, like energy efficiency, like heat. Mm. Okay. Dr. Howell? Yep. I don't think I have anything to oh, add okay, to that. Thank yeah. you. My, fi my final point, if I could come here, is um, I think it's quite clear that transport is one of the most worrying areas in terms of emissions. That's been shown, I think, in Richard Dixon's uh, paper. Um, and if I can just ask D Dr. Dixon to comment on this. Uh, you were quite critical, Dr. Dixon, about Transport Scotland. For, if I paraphrase, it was something about car-loving, road-building Transport Scotland. Um, and you, you effectively um, are quite critical of the plans for low-emission uh, vehicles, which is 40% by 2032. And you quote Belgium, Netherlands, Germany and Norway as having 100% uh, by 2025. Would you like to say a little bit more about that? Because presumably, over the next decade, transport's still going to be top of the league in terms of emissions. So we've got to conquer this, this issue around transport if we're going to succeed for achieving future targets. Yes, indeed. So, uh, as others have said, I, I'm certainly convinced that we need to do more than just technical measures, but we do need those technical measures. So, the standards that come for petrol and diesel vehicles from Europe or from our own resources in the future are very important, and how we do on electric vehicles is very important. And so, I was disappointed to see that what looks like a very unambitious number for 2030 in this plan of 40% of new sales being electric or ultra-low carbon uh, vehicles, um, the UK CCC has recommended that we should be aiming for 65%, so it's well below what our own advisors are telling us. And as I've mentioned in my paper, there are several countries in Europe, some of them much further ahead of us, like Norway, but some of them in about the same place in terms of electric vehicles already, which are aiming much, much higher. So there, there are live discussions about when should 100% of all vehicles be electric that are sold in our country and there are dates from 2025 to 2030 being discussed, and some of those are actually now real policies, not discussions. So there are people in Europe who think they can do much, much more than we, for some reason. If the Germans do this, that means the German car manufacturers are bought into it. That means electric vehicles will appear on a large scale at quite cheap prices because of the scale. So 
actually it may be German car manufacturers which drive this change in Europe rather than anyone's policy, but it's a shame that we're not setting a very ambitious policy. So I'm not sure how they came up with the 40% by 2030 number. Clearly that's a long, a big improvement from today, but it's not as much as our advisors say and it's not as much as others mm. are aiming for. So we would have liked to see much more on that. Mm. Dutch Pell. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to uh, extend this by um, adding that not only are the targets not strong enough in terms of the proportion of vehicles which are electric, but that that is um, not, not enough of a policy. It's actually inimical to other policies in this plan. So the transport uh, policies seem to rely entirely on technological changes, moving to greener vehicles, and encouraging people to uh, take up active travel. But there's no recognition whatsoever that in order to get people to take up active travel, you need to have policies to reduce car use. The expectation is we'll reduce car use by encouraging people to take up active travel. And that's the wrong way around. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a, an idea that pe becoming less reliant on a car will only happen if individuals change to walking, cycling, public transport and car sharing. That's on page 162. Um, people will only change to those modes if they can become re less, less reliant on cars. So I'm sure Richard would agree with me. It's not just about um, improving the targets for energy efficient cars. In this plan, there's a, an assumption that there will be an increase in the number of cars and that is, you know, that's not going to work for other policies on transport. Andy Kerr. Mm. Can I uh, just also flag the, the sort of sleeping giant here, which is around air pollution, and what we are seeing, particularly in other European cities, but we're going to see it in other cities around the world, are people just simply starting to assert that we are not going to allow certain types of cars, in particular diesel cars, mm. through cities after a certain period, for example, 2025. So we're starting to see big cities start to uh, be very... Um, uh, explicit about the need to move away from diesel and petrol and again this comes back to are we actually working properly with our cities who also have air pollution issues to work in partnership with the local authorities to in terms of developing some of these more um, radical uh, um, proposals because we are seeing that in other countries mm. and, and as Richard said you know we're going to the, the car manufacturers are going to respond to that yeah. very rapidly. So so finally, I know you're conscious of time, come here. For example, I think in London there's the issue of low emission zones, and what I'm sort of quite taken with is using analogy with congestion zones, where you actually bring in the income to make sure there's alternatives for modal shifts, such as more buses and so yeah. on. Um, but obviously, there's plans for low emission zones in Scotland. It's just a case of when it will actually happen. Yeah. yeah. Just to respond briefly on that. Um, I think there are a number of measures. We have obviously a commitment for a low emission zone in the programme for government, a first one somewhere in Scotland in an urban area by 2018, and there's a commitment in the climate change plan to add a, a climate change dimension to that work. But there are other policies, like workplace parking levies, which are not really in the plan. So there's a passing mention, but of course no local authority can actually implement one of those without primary legislation. But there's no plan in here to provide that opportunity. So the government could legislate to give local authorities that power. Doesn't mean that any of them will actually do it, but there's no proposal even to do that, even to provide the powers. And in the uh, SPICE paper, very helpfully, there's a summary of the research that was done in 2009 on transport measures, and it shows you that workplace parking levies are one of the very cheapest things you can do on transport to get you carbon reductions. Very cheap pounds per carbon saving, and they do exactly what Rachel Howell suggests, they discourage people from driving. They make them think, I'm going into the city today. How will I do that? Well, if I had to pay a bit extra at work, perhaps I'll go on the bus or the train mm. or even cycle. So uh, those kind of measures are not in the plan in any meaningful way. They're not proposals that will happen. And yet, to happen, they would need primary legislation. So they should be here in a, in a big way, but they're almost entirely missing. Okay. But, I, but I guess the measure that you've just articulated also hacks people off. Um, being hit with a parking levy and playing devil's advocate here, I think the question would be, how does that positively influence the mindset of individuals to change their behaviours? It may prompt them to do it grudgingly because it's hitting them in the pocket, but in it, overall, is it helpful to the direction of travel? Um, so there are clearly winners and losers in any of these measures. We need to change the way we do things. That means some people will not be happy and some people will find they benefit from those changes. So 
If the overall impact is that public transport is better and cheaper because more people are using it, then uh, most people will actually see a benefit. And where this has been done in the UK on a, a decent scale is in Nottingham, and they've raised enough money through a workplace parking levy to extend their tram network. Okay. So people can see the very direct benefit. There is a new tram because some rich lawyer is now paying to park it at his or her work. And so, you know, there's some people we could probably pick on who wouldn't be very popular who will be paying. <laughs> but we do need to be careful of the social MSPs, consequences of, of any of these measures. So any of the measures in the plan, we need to think of the social consequences. So there may be details you would change about a scheme and, and make it quite sophisticated. But broadly, we should be thinking about these parking policies, workplace parking levies, okay. uh, and low emission zones on a broader scale. It's useful to get that example on the record. That, that's very interesting. Andy Kerr and then Rachel Howe. No, just also coming back to your, your point, of course, this, this isn't, we're not in a static situation. You know, if you look at South East Scotland, we've got another, what, 60 to 100,000 homes coming in here in the next 10 to 15 years. You, know, you think of the, <laughs> the increase in transport induced transport of having another 100,000 people driving in and out of mm -hmm. and around Edinburgh, for example, um, on congestion and so on. So it's not as if we can just carry on as we are. We're mm -hmm. going to have to rethink how we move people around and between mm -hmm. cities, and, and that is part of this wider package of measures that's needed. Rachel Hill and then Mark. Um, it was one of the findings from the climate conversations was that people are very keen on improving public transport and I think the government has work to do to explain that improving public transport is part of a whole transport system. I think the other important point to make is that there is a difference between uh, policies being unacceptable before they are introduced and accepted afterwards and the perfect example of this is the London congestion charge where if you look at a graph of attitudes towards it before it was brought in uh, far, you know, a majority of people were against it. As soon as it was brought in, the graph does this, and it swaps over. And it, it was accepted, although it wasn't acceptable. And I think that policies like this are likely to, to show that kind of pattern. OK, good. Thank you. Mark Roscoe. I think the question that comes on the back of that, then, is to what extent these policies have actually been put through the Times model and, and assessed for both their cost and also their ability to reduce carbon and affect behaviour change. And I'm wondering to what extent you, you know, you, you sort of know what policy options have been put through. Um, I'll give you another one, for example, um, switching the default speed limit in Scotland in residential areas to 20 mile an hour from 30, uh, which could have a, a big impact in terms of reducing emissions at the tailpipe, but also, of course, could, uh, could incentivise active travel. Have we got the data on those types of policies to feed into the Times model? And do you believe that the Times model has actually looked at those as, as options? Richard Dixon. So as I mentioned uh, earlier on, the initial plan was for the Times model to include its own transport model so that it would be able to suggest sophisticated transport choices. That didn't prove possible because of time and complexity. And so what it does is it takes input from Transport Scotland's transport model. And so it is up to Transport Scotland how sophisticated their policy analysis is. And it doesn't look like it's been, been very sophisticated. So what they have fed in is that up to 2035, road kilometres driven will increase by about 23%. Over the last decade, they've only increased by about 4%. So already, that's a very big assumption. If you read the document, there is a mention of workplace parking charges in a way which makes you su suggest that it was once in and has been mostly taken out because it, it mentions occasionally this policy might interact with proposed workplace parking levies. But no one is proposing them because no one can do them because the primary legislation hasn't been passed to let them do them. So actually, that can never happen until the government acts. So it's not clear whether any of those policies have been fed into the transport model, which then feeds, in, feeds into times, or whether they've just been ruled out by Transport Scotland or deemed unacceptable in some political discussion and never actually modelled. So we don't know. Clearly, the, the policies you see in the transport chapter are almost entirely about technical fixes and new emission standards and switching to electric vehicles. There's a very amusing bit about how we can't have more people using public transport because there isn't enough infrastructure. So if you applied the same to roads, of course, you would say, well, there's only so much road space and there can't be more cars because there isn't enough room for them. But that isn't the approach of government. The approach of government is let's spend tens of billions over the next few decades and build lots more road space so we can have more cars. When it comes to buses or trains, 
that doesn't seem to be the approach. It's just, oh, well, it's limited by the capacity, so we can't have any more, which is an utterly crazy approach. When we had uh, the stakeholder event in December, the um, information we were shown about the starting assumptions going into times where this 23% increase in car kilometres, buses, absolutely static, no change at all, trains, walking, cycling didn't appear on the chart, so there doesn't seem to be any thinking about them. So I, I can only assume that we are living in a world of 20 years ago. 22 years ago, there was a, a SACTRA report and a Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution report, which both said, if you build lots of roads, traffic will appear to fill it up. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's a predict and provide uh, way of, uh, of running the world. And that seems to be where Transport Scotland still are. They say there'll be this much development, this many more people, more people will have cars, so we'll build more roads. If you build more roads, of course, more cars appear, more miles are driven. If instead you say, that is unacceptable, as Andy says, where will these cars go you know, on Edinburgh's congested streets, in Glasgow, in our other urban areas, uh, you would start from a much different presumption, saying, how can we stop that happening? How can we invest in other things and in behaviour change so that we don't have 23% more vehicle kilometres driven in 2025? Because we can't accept that on climate grounds. It's not good enough to just say, well, they'll be electric or they'll be much nicer, uh, tighter standards for diesel and uh, petrol. We need to actually be braver and say, no, we're going to change how people make their transport choices. So people will still drive cars, but perhaps it will be the second choice instead of the first choice for many people because we will have changed the way we think about and to do transport. Mm -hmm. Fabrice Vecchi and then Andy Kerr. Thanks. I think this discussion kind of neatly illustrates one of the key weaknesses of the, the draft plan. Um, and that's the fact that the, the policies, um, to, to borrow a horrible business acronym, need to be smart, to be specific, measurable, um, ambitious, um, realistic and time-bound. So these are kind of the key principles we'd be looking for in any plan. If I was writing my own plan for, to show my boss that I'm going to do my work, he'd expect to see some concrete um, timescales over which I'll do things and the scale at which <coughs> they'll be done. So to take this transport example, we do have in the climate change plan a, some vague terminology about low emission zones, the scope of those being broadened out to consider uh, carbon emissions. Uh, that's completely indeterminate. We don't know when that will happen. Uh, there's no indication as to uh, exact, the exact carbon impact that should be expected when they come to have that discussion. So in terms of trying to improve the plan, I think looking at these specific areas where we do have, we're heading towards a good idea, but we lack the fundamental information about when it will happen and what it will do. And I think to go back to, to Mark's point, I think a lot of the information about these policies is out there. It's within, well within uh, the possibilities of uh, the Scottish Government to, to find out what the impact of a workplace parking levy will be, what a low emission zone could do. And there are good examples uh, to use. So, for example, London, uh, the low emission zone there, uh, the proposal is to use that to make sure that all single-decker buses are fully electric by 2020. And that reflects the fact that electric buses are actually cost competitive almost now with their petrol and diesel cousins. And it provides the clarity to the bus operators within all of London that that's, what, that's the kind of fleet that they'll need to have. So there are concrete examples we could borrow from. Uh, unfortunately, the climate change plan still is, very, is worded in these very loose terms with no kind of specific outputs. Can I just pick up a point, Mark, that you made about things like the 20, going from 30 to 20 mile an hour zones, because that's a, that's a classic case where actually it's, it's, it's very difficult to pick the extent to which there are emission reductions associated with that. What there are are lots of co-benefits that come from having slower traffic, more livable cities, um, therefore more active travel, therefore you know, less, you know, it, it's easier for people to get out and walk and cycle and so on. So there's a lot of co-benefits, but actually in terms of does it deliver substantive emission reductions, they actually the, the evidence is very um, divided on that. So I think there are a lot of these things where the Times modelling framework struggles to deal with these, these types of complexities. And so part of what the, the government have tried to do is, is they've flagged a number of additional papers which start to look at those co-benefits, but they need to be teased out a lot going forward. And I think that's a lot of the benefits that we want to see within our cities or our towns are, are, may not, you know, may have a, a co-benefit of, of reducing some emissions, but actually the real benefit is cleaner air, better places to live, etc. And it's trying to get those read across 
um, between the Times type of framework, which is an optimization framework, and the and the reality of what we're we're seeking. And I think that's something that need to work basically going forward. Just um, moving on to another topic um, about heating, um, residential heating, and and the future of the gas network. Um, I mean, it's interesting in the plan, it identifies that around 20% of homes will be heated using low carbon sources uh, by 2025, but then that jumps up to 80% by 2032. Um, I mean, that appears to be about something else being put into the, the gas network, but what, what's your thoughts on the assumptions around that and the technological changes that are required? Fabrice Ovecki. So I think the, you know, we're pleased to see there's ambition on heat and a bit more description about the direction of travel to 2032. I think you've touched on a couple of issues with the, um, what's currently in the draft plan. Um, so in terms of the penetration of renewable heat to 2020, uh, that kind of illustrates again one of these policy gaps that we have in that there's no, there's no proposal to change any of the policies that we currently have to drive that change. Yet the trajectory to 2020 sees an acceleration in the next coming years of the delivery of those policies. So my question to, to the government is, what exactly is it that drives this uptake in the speed at which we do renewable heating in homes when there's nothing on, there's no concrete proposal in this plan to change any of the policy out there? So that's, that's the first issue. Uh, the second issue which you, you picked up on is the fact that we kind of relying on a distant technological fix to deliver a huge amount of emissions reduction. So the, the pathway for housing is renewable heat builds up gradually to 2020, flatlines, and then suddenly accelerates from 2025. And there are a couple of issues with that. I think the, the principal one being, it's not very credible to say to industry right now, uh, we're going to stop in 2020, we'll have five years of um, sitting on our hands, and then suddenly you'll be ready to go, and within seven years we'll have transformed most homes. Uh, the industries and companies are out there right now, and what they're looking for is a gradual, consistent growth in the markets and direction of travel. The second issue with the, uh, that HEAP proposal is, in terms of buildings, the way we decarbonise is both change the, the heat source to uh, something renewable, but also actually, first of all, you want to improve the fabric efficiency. So that's improving insulation, walls and lofts. And what we see in terms of the residential kind of uh, pathway in the plan is a slowing down in terms of energy efficiency, which is surprising given that there's another imperative there, which is fuel poverty and then actually a much bigger acceleration in the long term on the renewable heat side. So we're easing off on energy efficiency and we're accelerating on renewable heat with very little policy detail. So the actual proposal there is simply a proposal to have a proposal in the next climate change plan, which, what, why, again, wait three years to start developing a policy which is going to be so transformational. Okay. Andy Kerr. Just, um, when, I, when I looked at that, those figures and talked to a number of, of folk, it, did, it looked to us like a model artifact. In other words, the model is looking for cheap ways of heating ho homes. Um, something is changing over a period of time and suddenly it finds that it's the cheapest thing, so it just chucks everything into that space. And that's why you get that very steep thing. So to me, that was more to do with the assumptions written into the model than practice that is likely to take place. I think the thing that we do have is we obviously have extensive plans within Scotland around energy efficiency. Um, and yet, what we're not seeing here, that there's only a, an assumption of a, a fairly small reduction on the demand side for heat uh, within this. And to me, it's almost the wrong way around. You'd expect to see demand side for heat coming down because we're improving our buildings over the next 10 years very substantially. Um, and that but then makes it easier to deliver the low carbon supply into that space. Um, so I, 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 to me, this looked more like a you know, an artefact of model runs than, than something that's actually going to happen. Okay. Rachel Howell. Um, I'd like to pick up on Fabrice's question about what drives the uptake. I think that's an example of one of the concerns that I have about the um, approach taken in the plan as a whole. I get the impression that one of the assumptions made about what's going to drive the uptake of new technologies is an assumption that there will be public engagement policies happening that uh, people will become more aware and that they will go out and make deliberate choices based on a concern about climate change. And that's come partly from the climate conversations, from the findings that people express concern and say they want to do something and they want more information. 
So I think there's a very important point to be made about that type of research, which is that when you invite people who don't normally talk about climate change to come and do so, you are, in a sense, inviting them to step into an alternate universe. Um, so, and that the views they give represent how they think and feel in response to a specific exercise, in other words, taking part in a climate conversation. Now, I'm not suggesting that they are in any way um, lying or misrepresenting their views. I, I think that people, when they think about climate change, are concerned about it and do, in the moment, genuinely uh, want to do something and think that they want more information in order to do that. But then they step back into their own reality, their own lives, and if you look at what people spend time doing and what they want to spend time doing, finding information about climate change and things they can do about climate change doesn't figure at all. So people will go looking for information when they need information in order to do things that they want to do. So people aren't going to, for example, decide that they are going to uh, uptake these heating systems because of concern about climate change, a small proportion will, but not the majority of the population, they will look for information about heating systems when they need a new heating system and when other policies that change the structure of how we heat homes and whatever impact and it's no longer a good choice to get an ordinary gas boiler. So that's again an example of how you need to change structures in order to drive the desire to do something different and not expect that simply um, raising concern and doing public engagement will drive that uptake. But sorry, can I just pick up on that? Mm. Does that, the, the point you make, um, not fail to take account of um, the increasing awareness of the impacts of climate change? We seem over the last few years uh, to have seen more obvious impacts, you know, towns being flooded, areas that we know well being impacted upon. Is there not a possibility that that in itself will put uh, a momentum into behavioural change and, and alter the dynamic that we, we recognise currently? There's definitely increasing awareness and increasing concern, and there is, as I said, a proportion of the population for whom that does translate into action. I think it is always going to be a limited proportion, and unless it gets high enough to actually change what's considered normal, mm -hmm. it's not going to spread out. People do what is considered normal. So if you can change the structure so that you change what is normal, people will follow that. Um, and, and also... I, I think it's important to recognise that we, we imagine that people make choices, that there's either a situation in which people make a choice or there's a situation in which they are unable to make a choice, they're coerced or they don't have another choice to make. I think it's really important to recognise that there's a big area in between in which people aren't making choices. And, that's quite hard to get the head around, so if, uh, I'll illustrate by an example, if I may. If I were to ask how many people in this room have cleaned their teeth this morning, I would expect 100% people have. If I were to ask how many people had deliberated about whether to clean their teeth and had made a conscious decision, I would expect nobody has. We've all just done it as part of a routine. And many, many, many behaviours are like that. They aren't actually real choices in that sense, meaningful choices. Teeth cleaning is a, is a really good example where actually probably across the whole of our life we've never made that choice. We've been socialised into a practice from a very early age. Now, a lot of behaviours that have impacts on uh, carbon emissions, behaviours to do with water use, toilet flushing, laundry, showering and bathing, etc., a lot of behaviours to do with transport are not actually meaningfully chosen. Interesting. Claudia Beamish, briefly. Uh, thank you. I will. Um, good morning to everybody. Uh, I wonder if, in view of the remarks that you've been making up to now on assumptions, whether any of you have had the opportunity yet, and I appreciate it's still early days in the 60-day um, uh, scrutiny, but have you had the opportunity to assess um, any of the three evidence reviews of the potential wider impacts and how those have or haven't been taken into account in the, um, in the actual plan? Um, having just looked quite briefly at the transport one, I see there's a lot of uh, issues that are raised that we don't see in plan. Richard Dix. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's right. So the transport is the one that I've had a quick look at and also the strategic environmental assessment document. The transport document is useful in that it raises policies which are not apparent in the plan. I think the SEA is troublesome in that it doesn't talk about policies which may have been considered or may have been eliminated right at the start and talk about why that happened. 
So to me, that's, that's failing in what an SEA should do, which is to explain to you why we've ended up with what we've ended up with. Uh, and that should include the alternatives that were considered, even if it was only briefly. So I think there's definitely a gap, particularly on the transport side, of uh, some, some transparency about which policies were actually ever considered and why they were ruled out and didn't make it into the final plan. So I think those two documents are useful, but the SEE could be much more useful because it could have told us actually more about what's been eliminated. Okay. Okay, we're, we're moving really into the area of behaviour change, so let's have a look at that now. Uh, Finlay Carson. Convener, uh, we've actually heard an awful lot about beha behaviour change as we've gone through the, the morning and heard a, a range of opinions. Um, what I'd like to, to, to look more at is how uh, behaviour change is considered uh, in the development of the plan. Where, where, where's your thoughts on how that, what role behaviour change is, is, is made? Um, and also your views on how the Scottish Government should build on the, 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 the low carbon behaviours and finalising the document, how we can move forward from what we've got just now. I'd also like you to consider uh, where do you think market forces come in, into it. You know, you've, you've touched on electric cars and whatever and the impact. Do you think that's been considered uh, enough in the behaviour changes that have been assumed? Rachel Hill. Um, just allow me to collect my thoughts. So how it's been considered in the plan, um, one of the things that really stuck out for me is that um, on page 29 there are key behaviour areas outlined that have uh, been quite a long-standing um, ambition um, for behaviour change uh, by the Scottish Government. And these, in many cases, um, are not reflected or are only very poorly reflected in the policies and proposals detailed later. So there seems to be a disconnect between long-standing ambitions and what is now there in the plan. Um, I mentioned the ISM model. That's mentioned as having fed in occasionally to ideas about behaviour change. Now, as I said, I think the ISM model is a significant improvement over other models about behaviour. Um, but this plan still reflects an idea, as I've, I've said, about deliberate behavioural choices. So I think what's happening with the ISM model, a good model has been developed, it's being used, and then it's kind of being forgotten that people... It, it, you gather data, or sorry, not you, but gather, data is gathered, and then the, the social and material aspects of that model are kind of forgotten. So, for example, on um, page 165, there's a, a box which gives an example of an ISA, ISM consultation about the use of heating controls. One of the things that came out about that was that people find heating controls complicated and want simpler designs, but all the suggestions at the end are about advice and uh, information aimed at individuals. It's going back to the idea of simply behaviour change uh, based on information. There's nothing in there about trying to encourage different design of heating controls. And similarly, as I mentioned before, um, the idea, or, or I didn't mention this before, sorry, um, page 87, it mentions programmes that support people to overcome information, awareness, skills, confidence and attitudinal barriers to walking and cycling. Those are all individual barriers in the ISM model. There's nothing in there whatsoever about the need to focus on making it objectively less dangerous to cycle, which is frequently brought up as a problem. And that's, you know, so... so Data is collected about all the different factors, and then the policies focus once more on individuals. Um, I am also, there was also the, the consultation or the, the climate conversations, which fed in in terms of finding out what people know and what they think. I did wonder to what extent those have really influenced the plan, um, given that there was this headline finding that public transport was a, a consistently popular theme and there was strong support for um, improvements, when, as we heard earlier, there is also mention on page 70 that any behavioural switch from public sorry, from private to public transport is likely to be limited by capacity of the sector to absorb significant new traffic, and there's no plan to increase that capacity. So it feels to me like there is a genuine desire to, um, to bring in behaviour change, but it's not being done in a coherent way whatsoever. It's the, the, the actual policies don't reflect the key behaviours. There's 
very little ambition in certain areas. So, for example, very limited ambition for reducing heating demand, as we mentioned, reducing car use or air travel demand, no ambition whatsoever to reduce meat and dairy consumption, which would be part of um, Key Behaviour 9, not only a more sustainable diet, but a healthier diet, so all the, co the co-benefits. On that, do you think, is that because you think a lot of the targets can be met easily because of technological changes and actually behavioural changes are far more difficult to, to achieve so we can actually get acceptable outcomes by not doing very much. Mm. And so the behavioural ones are down the list because it's not the low hanging fruit. I think that may be the perception. I think that's an entirely wrong perception. As I've already mentioned, focusing simply on making cars greener is actually going to impact the ability to increase active travel. I think behaviour change can be difficult to bring in if you if you focus simply on trying to raise awareness and to get people to make conscious choices because of a concern about climate change. That's why it's not a low-hanging fruit. It is very clear, if you look at the history of how practices change, that it can actually be very easy to change behaviours if you change the material and social structures that influence, and not just influence, but actually create those behaviours. If you make... Um, car use a lot less attractive, a lot more difficult, it will change people's behaviours. Um, people might not like it to begin with, but there will be a lot of co-benefits that they will like. So I think, yes, I think you're absolutely right, that is the perception, and I think the way behaviour change is approached can make it very difficult. But there is a great risk in focusing on technology that you won't achieve, or the government won't achieve what it wants to achieve. And further, I think there's there's a recognition in this that um, it matters what technologies people take up, to what extent they're adopted, but there's no recognition of it's also important how they use them. You know, technology is not a sort of a thing that you can just sort of put out there and it magically does its own work. It's used by real people uh, in their everyday lives. So technology isn't a sort of a simple thing because you can just take people out of the equation. So, you know, often you don't get the energy efficiency benefits that engineers believe will be the case with a particular new bit of kit because people don't use them in the way they're expected. Okay. Um, I'll come to Fabrice Lake. Can I just ask the witnesses as well, um, rather than simply endorse something that's been said earlier in order to try and allow us to make a lot of progress, if, if you've something to add, that's great, but if we could avoid just endorsing uh, what's already been said, uh, Fabrice Lake. Uh, yeah, so on the behaviour change point, and um, in answer to your question, I think, um, in my mind, it's a three-prong approach. It's information, it's using incentives, and it's using regulation. So um, that's the kind of framework that we need to have, and I think there has been a focus um, by policymakers on the technology change, because often it's easier to regulate uh, companies, um, there's fewer of them, they're centralised. I think, to use an example, um, to be fair to the Scottish Government, energy, domestic energy efficiency is an area where they've put quite a lot of effort in. So this is an area that's progressing, albeit too slowly. Um, but if we look there in terms of what they've tried to do, we have information, yes, so energy performance certificates. If you sell a house or if you rent a house, you have to provide one of those. That provides information to the householder about um, the energy efficiency improvements they could make, as well as renewable heat. We haven't really tried uh, the incentives and the regulation part. So. Um, in terms of financial incentives, for example, we need to tackle the, the split between the landlord and the tenant. So the landlord pays for the, the measures, but the tenant gets the benefits. So we have to tackle the financial um, imperative there. And then lastly, we also need to use regulation. So yes, it might be difficult, and that's probably why regulation, um, as part of the energy efficiency proposals, despite being in RPP 1 and 2, is still indeterminate, still yet to be have a date fixed on it. So the regulation part would allow us to say when you uh, sell a house, it's a perfect time to actually get these improvements done because the house is empty. So one of the big barriers behind making energy efficiency improvements is simply emptying the loft or having to move your furniture. So if we regulate and say if you, you can't sell a house unless it's a certain energy performance standard, that would tackle that problem. It'd be agreed, buyer and seller, find an arrangement, who pays and when that work happens. So we've done the information, we're starting to think about the incentives, but there's been a lack of... Um, political will to really push on the regulation part. And in terms of all the bits we could regulate for climate change, I think energy efficiency is something that brings an economic benefit. So it's within most people's interests to do the, the cost-effective measures, makes your house warmer, improves health, and from a social perspective, 
it also tackles fuel poverty. So yeah, my, my call would be yes, absolutely. We haven't done the harder bits, but we really need to. Andy Kier. Just coming back to your point, uh, your question about market forces. Um, yeah, we are going through quite extraordinary um, transformation in markets. So if you if you look around the world and say, what's the biggest transport company? It's actually a data company. It's Uber. Yeah. So we're starting to see an awful lot of these big changes starting to play into the markets that we see about moving people around or energy efficiency and so on. Um, these are very difficult challenges for a modelling framework to pick up because it's as much about who actually takes up these types of technologies and how do we use them rather than just they in themselves are delivering emission reductions. And so I would just, you know, I would just flag it's a very difficult framework. What we need to do is just realise that this is happening, identify where market forces are working in our favour uh, and, and then think about how we're working with the delivery agents, which might be a local authority, they might be local bus, bus companies, they might be local um, taxi companies, and actually work with those partners to see how we can develop that to go down a particular pathway. Um, so that's, again, picking up the social structures issue, um, rather than saying, you know, we've got a, a, an explicit thing that will reduce emissions and that will just work as an independent technology. Uh, and it's just a, it's a challenging space to be in the next few years because the pace of change is so quick at the moment. Okay. Um, Dr. Hull, given your expertise in this area, can I ask a question about, it's obviously about behavioural change, but if, if a sector, let's take agriculture, has contributed, and it's generally accepted, far less than it ought to have done in mm. terms of emissions reduction up till now, um, when there has been uh, the voluntary approach deployed, what is the likelihood in your experience of a continuing emphasis on the voluntary and the encouraging uh, producing the kind of improvements we're looking for or do we need to, to, to move towards more compulsion? I think you need both the bottom-up and the top-down approach. I don't think volunteerism will get us as far as we need to go. It can be a good start, but I think, yes, probably top-down regulation is more necessary. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, let's look at the monitoring, evaluation, implementation elements of this. Uh, Jenny Goldruth. Um, it's clear that we do need robust procedures to meet the targets set out by RPP3, and, and that was obviously something that there was concern about in terms of RPP2. And a large part of that process will involve this new governance body, which will report directly to Cabinet. Um, and I appreciate, Andy Kerr, what you said at the start of the committee today. You said, inevitably, this type of modelling framework ends up looking technocratic. So I just wondered what the panel's views were uh, on the role of this new governance body, how it's going to operate, and I think, importantly, how it's going to engage with as wide a range of stakeholders as possible, because I think, as well, Andy Kerr, you spoke about uh, the relationship in terms of partnerships with those stakeholders and how you involve them in that process and affect behaviour change, which we've just spoken about. OK. Andy Kerr. Um, so I think I'll, I'll... Firstly, I'll just reiterate, I think the monitoring framework that's being proposed is actually sensible and it's clear and... It's not there yet, but mm -hmm. the building blocks are there to make it work. So I think I, you know, we were quite pleased to see what, what had been put down on that. What's not clear for me is whether the governance body that's been proposed is entirely independent of and separate from the policy teams. And, oh, is it an independent thing looking in, or is it some mix? I mean, I think we would say it needs to be some mix with mm -hmm. both government and independence, which would include some of the, the key stakeholders like key local authorities or you know, key business areas and so on, to ensure that actually we're getting this wider buy-in um, and oversight of what is happening, because this has to be a partnership process going forward. Mm -hmm. It cannot be done top-down yeah. uh, alone. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, does that answer your question? So. Yeah, I think so. I'd be interested in the rest of the panel's views as well, if that's possible. Fabrice Silvecki. Thank you. I think the, in terms of the, the monitoring and evaluation framework, I think the principles are there. I think it's fundamentally um, undermined by the lack of detail about what specific policies will deliver. So I can't really imagine how we will go back and monitor the progress of policies when all we have are very vague uh, words um, to affect. Uh, think about doing a change at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not talking about specific numbers of measures. We're not talking about timescales when they have to happen. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an enormous issue for that framework because without that information about policies, how, how are they going to uh, go about doing their job? Mm -hmm. On the second point, in terms of should it be, is it the role of the governance body to do the wider stakeholder engagement that needs to happen? I'm, I'm not yeah. entirely sure. Um, I think 
there's a role for government in terms of engaging with business, uh, engaging with the wider public, which um, probably happened far too late within this climate change plan process. But I think that's more of an ongoing thing for the government in terms of uh, you know, but the reason we have a monitoring and evaluation framework is that we, we come back to this every year. It's not just every four years we do a climate mm -hmm. change plan. Suddenly we're starting to think about this. Um, but I'd say the jury's out in terms of, I think that for me, the governance framework, uh, the governance body has to make sure we're delivering against the measures and the actions that are in the climate change plan, or at least we hope to see in the climate change plan. Mm -hmm. But doesn't the, the, the framework uh, create the opportunity um, for Parliament to be far more involved in this process? Because if you've got an annual report being produced from 2018 onwards, the opportunity and the expectation could be there for each of the committees that scrutinise in the plan, and perhaps others, to be dipping back into it on an annual basis and holding the government to account um, through the, that mechanism that becomes available to it. Richard Dixon. Yes, I hope, I hope that's the case. Um, I hope that the report will be more than something that the committees use, um, but, and that's not clear. It's not clear what the status of that report is. It's not clear when it will come, in what part of the cycle. So obviously there are already reports required by the current Climate Act, including a report mm. every time there's an annual target result. Uh, and so will this come as an appendix to that report, which would be useful? Will it come just before the budget discussions, so it can inform the budget discussions to say these policies aren't performing or we haven't even started them yet, we need money in the budget? So I'm sure it'll be a useful report, but its status isn't clear. Will, it, will a minister stand up and release it in Parliament and there'll be a discussion? Will it simply slip out and committees will have to spot it and do something with it? So potentially very useful, but we need some more clarity on exactly when and what form it's going to come in. And in terms of the governance body, as you asked the civil servants last week, it's not really clear who's going to sit on it. You, you mm -hmm. asked about whether NGOs mm -hmm. would sit yeah. on it. I don't know if they've answered you yet by, in writing. But, not yet. <laughs> right, okay. But I think, again, we need clarity on what this, what's the remit of that group. And does this group replace the, the internal group that had James Curran on as an external person, which hasn't met for a long time? Does it replace the Cabinet subcommittee? Because there's no commitment that that subcommittee will continue to exist. And if so, do we think that that body is up to the job of replacing a cabinet subcommittee? Because a cabinet subcommittee certainly sounds a powerful thing, and we were all pleased when it was created a couple of years ago. But, if, but I go back to the point I was making. If we have a, and I accept it's an if, but if we get to a position where on an annual basis the committees of the parliament see this as a fundamental part of their work, and organisations like Friends of the Earth will be making written submissions to tell us what they think of the figures and we would be potentially holding all the cabinet secretaries to account, does that not potentially open up a far better way to move forward on this? I think it does. So I think we're all enthusiastic about the report. We need more detail and I hope, like you, that the committees will embrace it. So I'm sure this committee will, but I hope the other committees which are scrutinising the plan will also feel ownership and feel they, they will want to come back to that report as well. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Rachel. So going back to your question um, about uh, governance and engaging with a wide range of stakeholders, I'd like to comment on what more needs to be in if our recommendations about more ambitious behavioural change policies um, being included. Um, in that case, I think it's very important that there is a continuing conversation uh, with the general public. That a Climate conversation shouldn't be a one-off intervention, but there should be a, a continuing conversation with people who wouldn't necessarily um, respond to written consultations and so on. Um, so questions for the government would be things like, can it be seen to adapt policies to feedback from the people whom they impact? Can it listen and learn um, about those policies? Okay. Jenny Gordis. In, t in terms of feedback from people out with the usual suspects, how important is it that we actually engage with young people uh, when it comes to f uh, formulating plans like these? I mean, this committee last week had a session with groups of young people from across the country with an interest in this, but it does strike me that this whole process does things unto young people. We, we lay down proposals and policies for 20, 30 years' time that will in fact impact more on them than many of us sat around the table. So is that somewhere we're coming up short? It's absolutely essential that policies engage with young people and that it allows young people to shape at least part of that agenda. So it doesn't simply go to young people with questions that the government wants answered, but that it actually asks young people 
to tell the government what they want to say. Young people are really concerned about climate change. Um, they are also locked into ways of life which um, in some areas are particularly high carbon. For example, um, 20 to 29 year olds are most likely to take flights. Um, they're, they're living in a world which has been shaped by an older generation. I think there's a certain um, level of... <sighs> I don't think it's got to despair at all. I mean, the young people I teach tend to be quite hopeful, more hopeful than I am a lot of the time. But certainly a, a frustration with the um, what they perceive as a lack of engagement. So, yes, I think there definitely needs to be more engagement, but I, I would stress that point about allowing young people to partly shape the agenda. For, so, for example, just yesterday, I was speaking to a very engaged student of mine who is going to run a climate conversation, and she's got the template to run it. But she says, quite a lot of this is just not relevant to us as students. You know, what's the point of asking certain questions of people who don't own their own homes and have no capital? You, you know, so, you, you, yeah, you've got to allow young people to shape the dialogue as well as uh, just asking them things okay uh, Andy Kerr of course we're very lucky in Scotland because we do have a whole series of groups like the mm. 2050 group which I think you met last week um, who are creating these amazing networks in, in different cities so I mean I, in that sense we've, we've actually got everything we need to, to actually engage much more effectively uh, in future but it's just how we engage more effectively it's how you engage yeah, <coughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. but again this to me comes back to um, at the moment, this, because of the way it's been framed, has been something of a top-down system. Again, what I would be asking Parliament to do is to hold the Scottish Government to account, which is that going forward, this will only be delivered if we're working in partnership. And that means with young people, it means with local authorities, it means with certain business sectors, social enterprises. You know, that, that to me is the determinant of whether it's actually going to work or not. And, and that's, the, that's really, as long as I'm pushing it back to you, but that's really where you need to be saying to the government, what are you actually doing in this space? Okay, okay, thank you for that. Um, Emma Harper. Thanks, uh, Convener. It's really more to uh, look at what kind of suggestions that you would have for further engagement with stakeholders, like maybe young friends of the earth, uh, that would maybe be for you, uh, Richard Dixon, that how would you engage in the young people for that way? You've talked about, uh, Andy Kerr mentioned engaging with businesses, not just the technocratic model. And uh, you know, the, I'm sure that you probably have ideas of how you would further engage people. Uh, Richard Dixon. Uh, yes, so I had a very good report back from Young Friends of the Earth uh, about the meeting that you held last week about stakeholder engagement, particularly with young people. So they were very positive about that. And that's clearly the beginning of a journey. And so they're very willing to engage with that. That meeting was about how to engage rather than what they thought of the climate plan, for instance. And they're perfectly capable of writing you a response to tell you what they think of the climate plan, just as anyone else in Scotland is entitled to do but uh, actually more structured engagement with that, that grouping that you met last week around what do you actually think of the plan and letting them devise some of the questions, as Rachel suggests, I think would be a really good start in your in accelerated engagement with young people. Because after all, this plan and the climate bill to come are two of the things the Parliament is doing which will most affect young people, things with longest horizons and most impact on their lives. So absolutely essential, as you've seen, to make sure you can do that well. I turn that back on you and ask, do you practice what you preach? Because it was suggested to us that the young Friends of the Earth had not had their views sought around the submission that Friends of the Earth made on the climate plan. Um, you're quite right. Young Friends of the Earth is a very... Uh, Scotland is a very young body within the Friends of the Earth network in Scotland. And so, uh, in terms of putting something in in a hurry, they were not part of that loop. So we need, we need to do better on young people too. Thank you for that confession, Andy <laughs> Kerr. <laughs> um, just to give you an example of where there needs to be much better engagement, you know, we've got a, a situation where both the UK and the Scottish Government are investing heavily into cities across Scotland with the city deals. Um, these are putting in housing, infrastructure, digital transport infrastructure, which is going to be operating in a zero carbon world in 20, 25 years time. The extent to which those deals are actually writing in and thinking about and engaging with this, um, this type of agenda is very unclear. Um, so I think there's a real opportunity then to sort of be sitting down and working with the teams, the city authorities, the city regions that are developing those things. Those are about giving 
investments from the government, but also about leveraging in private sector money into that space and developing jobs, et cetera, et cetera, around particular areas. Um, so again, that engagement with business comes from a lot of these major infrastructure changes that we're looking at over the next few years. Um, because, and similarly, if you look at things like the energy efficiency plan, there's a lot of talk in the, in the plan at the moment about the 500 million that's been allocated for energy efficiency. But actually, to deliver the sorts of changes for two and a half million households, you're going to need an awful lot of private money coming into that space. So that needs to be an engagement with businesses who are developing the skill sets to, to service that need, but also with, with individuals. And it, it's those sorts of things that actually determine whether it's going to work or not. Um, so it's, it, that's what I'm thinking about in terms of that engagement. There are particular points where we can engage over the next year or two um, which have not been engaged as well as they might have been. And I think that's a, that's a key issue, given that we're talking about putting in infrastructure that's going to be operating for 20, 30 years. Okay. For, uh, for uh, just on the, in terms of engaging young people, I think um, absolutely we need to talk about the vision and the positive benefits of all these changes. Uh, this inevitably becomes quite a technocratic exercise about the number of lofts you do, the number of electric vehicles, but I think messaging that really works, I think it's starting to be reflected in the climate change plan, although there's a lot more to do, is to talk about cleaner air, renewed cityscapes, the industries of the future. That's the vision that young people and the wider public get engaged with. Because I think the climate change plan kind of has to set the direction of travel. People want to know kind of what's, what is the future? What are we going to get off? What are we going to do once we're on fossil fuels? Now, what, what are we going to be doing in the future? On the other, other point in terms of business, I think um, Andy's absolutely right. We need to think about the economic opportunities. And the way you engage business is to kind of frame this as it's an economic strategy. So it's a host of incentives, of regulations, which will change some markets and create new opportunities. And I think there's a lack in this climate change plan in terms of seizing the benefits, uh, in particularly the areas that Scotland has an advantage, which is domestic energy efficiency, it is renewable heat, things like heat networks, electric heat pumps. And I think going forward, I think they need to do much more to engage that industry and also frame this as an opportunity rather than we'll do a few changes around the, around the edges, um, but it's essentially business as usual. Rachel Howell. Um, I think it's also very important to engage people in conversations within the context of what they are interested in. So for example, I'm sure there must be at times initiatives to engage young people in deprived neighborhoods in yeah. conversations and plans about how to improve their neighborhood. That would be a place to have a conversation about a transport plan or whatever. So rather than invite people specifically to climate change conversations, to take the opportunity to talk about it where people are talking about health, neighbourhoods, whatever, pretty much any conversation can also have an element which will, um, you'll be able to get good, good data and good ideas about aspects of uh, a climate change plan. Okay. So I'll let Finlay Carson before Emma wraps this up. Thanks, Gary. Just in the back of that, should, should the stakeholder group then be increased so we're not just looking at young friends of the earth or, 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 or youngsters who are already involved in climate change uh, topics. So we had the young farmers as well. So directly, the, you know, climate change is very important to them. But ultimately, the day-to-day -day job of earning a living off the land is their priority. Um, you talked about inner cities and, and transports, the driving force between uh, for young people on low incomes or whatever. So do we need to look at a far wider stakeholder to actually get the engagement, rather than just those groups that are already uh, involved in climate change topics? Yeah, Simple. 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 that was short and sharp. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Emma Harper, do you want to wrap this up? Yeah, I mean, just on the back of the engagement of stakeholders, and Finlay's talked about young farmers, and I'm interested in farmers in general because the climate change um, draft plan talks about, you know, language that's not really definitive. It says most farmers, many farmers, we expect instead of require. And you talked about compulsory versus voluntary like work that the farmers should do. Do you think it needs to be enhanced and language, I guess, described in a different way? Oh. <laughs> I'm looking <laughs> at you all. <laughs> um, Brice Lebec, sorry. I'll give you time to gather your thoughts. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. I've just got here. Um, the, I think we, we set out, WWF set out a criteria by which we judge uh, the climate change plan. Um, match criteria, measurable, um, achievable. I won't go into them all, but 
agriculture is the one that fails them all, um, frankly. And to give you an example of the kind of woolly wording that we have, so one of the, um, I think, policies is farmers are more aware of the benefits and practicalities of cost-effective climate mitigation. So they're more aware, and that's it. We have no idea what they might do with that information, uh, when they might do those things, or what benefits th those will have. Uh, so absolutely, I think there's also a table in the agricultural section which talks, uh, has a useful sort of milestones. So it's the policy change over time. And um, if you look there, it's the same policy changes uh, repeated um, over the whole decade. There's no quantified change in terms of how many more farmers are doing things like soil testing, are more aware of the nitrogen budgets, that kind of thing. So you're absolutely right, agriculture is uh, one of the areas that really, really does need to be tightened up. Just, um, I think on things like ag agriculture, the other thing I'd, I'd flag is that, you know, we know it's going to be a hugely challenging period for those in agriculture. You know, if you take something like the sheep industry, you know, if they lose access to the, to the, um, um, to the European markets, you know, are they still going to retain the sort of subsidy? So it's at these periods of real spectacularly change, which, which could be really, really challenging for the industry. That surely is the time to be engaging with them to say, look, OK, we know things are changing. We don't know exactly how it's going to pan out. But actually within that, we can't carry on as before. Therefore, what is the vision that will deliver against these, but also to ensure they've got markets, ensure they've got jobs, so it gets tied into being part of that conversation. So as, said, as, as Rachel said, you don't have it as a separate conversation with them, which is where it's tended to be to date. You actually have it much more as being, this is core to actually the future of this sector. Um, because I, I would echo the, the point that these are very, this is very woolly language. Um, and the big challenge we've had with agriculture has we've got vast numbers of people um, in agriculture and actually rather like dealing with small and medium-sized businesses, you know, each one is their own business and therefore it's a real challenge to actually uh, get them in a piece. But if there is an existential threat to the industry anyway because of all the changes that are happening, actually that is the time when you can capture their attention and talk about what's the vision that will work for them as well. Okay. Rachel Hill. The reason I hesitated when you asked that question, despite the fact that I have been saying we do need more regulation, is that there are places in the plan where, yes, it might be appropriate to replace words like expect or, or you know, hope or whatever with require. I'm also trying to get across the idea that there needs to be more in the plan which isn't about expecting individuals to do things. So when it comes, for example, to transport, I'm not suggesting that we need to see more... Um, you know, we will require more people to choose cycling over car use, but more where... It, it says we will use um, city planning regulations or we will bring in new regulations that will change a situation in which car driving dominates as a practice. So, yes, there needs to be stronger regulation, but it doesn't all need to be focused at individuals. Um, just to wrap this up, picking up on Richard Dixon's perfectly valid point about how tight a time frame we have to scrutinise an RPP and the, the, the challenges that presents for your organisation to get a submission in. Just to get, briefly get your views on, does the forthcoming climate bill require to amend the 2009 Act to allow stakeholders, young people have more of a say and the Parliament to have more time to scrutinise by the time we get to RPP4? Richard Dixon. Uh, yes, I think that would be very sensible. Um, the, the Times model has taken more time than expected and then good plans have not managed to be realised because, of course, we were running towards a deadline of getting the RPP in front of you. And indeed, it came to you late with your agreement and that was perfectly sensible to allow more time for it to be finished off and to give you the full time for scrutiny. But I think the, the fact that you've got a short time scale to look at it is frustrating for those who want to feed in. Um, no doubt frustrating for you in terms of the level of depth that you can go into in certain areas and the inquiry you can make of ministers and of civil servants and of stakeholders. So I think looking at that issue in the new bill would be very wise and building in some stakeholder component or at least space, even if not spelled out, but space for a stakeholder component into that scrutiny would be very helpful. Okay. Uh, Rachel Howell. Um, in addition to that, I feel that the consultation with experts, which is happening now, is a little bit thin 
Um, I feel a lot of weight on my shoulders, for example, being here as a behaviour change expert. Um, I realise that there is a public consultation and people can write into that, but I think in future it would be a good idea to have a process where um, the committee is able to specifically seek the views of a lot more experts. I know other um, committees are asking more experts, but um, I, think, I think there are a lot more experts, and particularly experts from out with Scotland. Um, so there are plenty of academic experts who would have useful views on things like behaviour change that is not specific to Scotland. Um, so, for example, I've obtained um, views from another expert whose opinions I trust that have informed what I've been saying today, but I haven't had time to go and, and seek wider mm. views. And I, th I think, you know, if you need more time next time round to approach more experts and to look out with Scotland, then yes, I think... You, th because the UKCCC, I think, did recommend that the Scottish Government look at directly involving a behavioural scientist in, in mm. um, all of their work around climate change. So it's a fair point. Mm. Anybody else want to come in on that? Are you content? OK, that's great. Uh, well, let's move on to wrap this up by looking at how the plan might be improved. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Kavina. There's been um, a lot of comment this morning which has obviously been very valuable um, for the committee about... Um, quite specific issues around how the plan might be improved. So th those points have been noted. Uh, uh, beyond that, um, and in parallel with that, could I highlight one issue as an example, which I raised um, last week in committee, which was concerns um, about the lack of information included in the plan uh, related to blue carbon. And in response, Scottish Government officials agreed to look further at the issue and noted, I quote, the scrutiny process should throw up things that we are required to do more on and to look further. Um, so uh, just as, as we close this session, I, I would ask you if there are other specific areas or indeed comments on blue carbon, which isn't in the plan, although um, there was a, a small box on it in the last, in the RPP too. Are there issues that, um, to put you finally all on the spot, that you would... Um, think should be considered um, further. Okay. Uh, Fabrice Lovergi. Uh, thanks. That's a really good question. I think uh, the committee has, the committees have a real job to do, a really important job in terms of improving the climate change plan. <coughs> and I think from our perspective, the, the most important things, I and mean, you've had a lot of criticism today probably, I think the most important things to retain would be making sure we use this process to drive actual change. So, for example, uh, domestic energy efficiency. We've been told for a year and a half that a new infrastructure priority is on the way mm. and that more detail would be forthcoming in the climate change plan. Yet the detail that's actually in the plan um, doesn't talk about regulation or dates when that might happen. We know that funding has already been frozen now out to 2021. So obtaining more information from the government in terms of what does that uh, energy efficiency programme have to deliver in terms of climate change as well as fuel poverty would be a great outcome. On, in the transport sector, I think focusing more on in terms of what detail do we have, when the thing's going to happen in terms of the demand side measures, low emission zones, workplace parking levies. The, the detail in the plan is just too scant and too vague that we don't know if uh, we, we don't know if we'll actually have conversations about these policies in the coming years or if we'll be at the next climate change plan talking about the same proposals um, once again. Okay. Rachel Hull. Well, at risk of repeating myself, the three things that I think should be in the plan aren't are uh, proposals to directly reduce car use and not just to see that as a benefit of increasing active travel, to uh, reduce demand for air travel and to reduce meat and dairy consumption. Okay. Richard Dixon. Um, so I agree with the previous panel members, but in addition to that, I would say um, a good questioning of the big assumptions that are in here. So we've raised, for instance, Brexit. What does it mean? What's the contingency plan? The assumption that there will be new standards that will make vehicles cleaner. Well, we should learn from Dieselgate that even if there are standards, they may not work. So the credibility, <coughs> even where there are numbers. Um, and I think the, the key thing for the committees of the Parliament is to ensure that you will have in future enough information that when you interrogate the annual report from the monitoring and evaluation exercise, you can tell, are we on track? And you can tell, are we spending the money in the right places? And how much money do we need to spend next time to get us on track or to keep us on track? So those are the, those are the key details for you to make sure that Scotland stays on track to deliver. And I think you don't have that information in this plan. So getting more detail in here will help you do that in the future. Okay, thank you. And finally, Andy Kerr. 
Um, I can't comment on blue carbon, sorry. Um, for me, I think uh, we're getting to the point where um, we cannot deliver. To me, it's all about deliverability. So, and that cannot be done top down. That has to be done in partnership. So the question is, do we have that? Not just the, the, the understanding from the partners, but the actual buy-in. Are they actually taking this forward themselves, thinking that it's a good thing because it's going to support their their, their own um, areas? Uh, the other one is about reducing misalignment of resource spend and lock-in. Um, and the third one is is behaviour change cannot be just an add-on. You know, it is about socially, how do we structure our society to deliver all the benefits that we want, including jobs, good economy, and so on, but deliver that low-carbon benefit. And, and I think that's the, those are the three things that um, are touched on in the plan, in different parts of the plan, but it, it would be nice to see that absolutely explicit, because that is at the heart um, of whether we actually achieve these targets. Okay, thanks. And finally, Mark Roscoe. Uh, one area which isn't considered in the climate plan or the energy strategy because it's subject to a separate consultation is fracking and the future of unconventional gas. I mean, how much of an impact do you think a decision either way could have on the success of this plan and the policies within it? Richard Dixon. And so we're hoping to see a fracking consultation this week. So we'll have four months for everybody to express their views and at some point there will be a a government proposal which will come to Parliament for a vote, so we might see that in the autumn. Of course, we have Claudia Beamish also proposing a bill which would ban fracking. So, uh, And we are obviously very pleased to see that neither this plan nor the energy strategy s assume that fracking will go ahead and include it. So even though there hasn't been no official government decision, it's not included in either this document or the energy strategy. And clearly they've made the numbers add up, both, uh, although we can't see all the numbers, but the numbers we can see add up to delivering Scotland's targets and also to uh, an energy strategy that seems pretty sensible without fracking, without new nuclear. So those were two of the highlights for us of the energy strategy is that fracking's not in there. Looking at the resources in Scotland, looking at the research that the Scottish Government commissioned on fracking, the resource is pretty small. So if fracking were to go ahead, it will be a lot of political upheaval, a lot of bad feeling for actually really very small amount of energy. So we would be uh, very disappointed if at the end of the process, the fracking consultation process ends with a, a vote in Parliament to proceed with fracking because it takes us in the wrong direction, increases carbon emissions, the industry would try to argue that fracked gas is low carbon, but that only really works if it's displacing coal in power stations. And, of course, we've closed both of our coal power stations. So what it would be doing is competing with renewables or distracting us from energy efficiency, which is the areas, the, those are the areas where we should be putting our effort. OK. Uh, Rachel Howell. So uh, two points. I think uh, fracking would lock us in longer to unsustainable technologies. Um, and... It, it, in terms of public engagement, in terms of um, people's attitudes, what the government does matters. So um, public opinion is behind um, wind power, even though locally there may be protests, it's generally behind it and it's generally anti-fracking. Uh, a decision in the opposite direction by the government would, I think, um, lead people to believe that the government isn't serious about certain targets. and. People are really influenced by that. People do say things like, well, you know, if they're really serious about it, they would be doing this, that and the other. And if they're not, then it obviously means the problem isn't as great. So I think it will have an impact on how urgent and important people think it is to develop, uh, an, a, a, for example, a grid entirely powered by renewables. Um, yeah, so I, I think it would make a difference. Both, both in terms of the structural things we've been talking about and in terms of attitudes. Uh, you, you did make the point that people are behind wind power, but of course offshore wind's been undermined by an enver environment organisation and mounting a legal challenge, which is most unfortunate. Uh, Andy Kerr. I'm, I'm on record, and I think in front of this committee, as saying I'm, I'm less worried about where the gas comes from. I'm much more interested in what we do with the gas and whether we can reduce our gas demand. Um, so I'm, I'm actually fairly relaxed about whether we frack or not. I think the bigger issue for this committee is going to be the question of how we're going to deliver our low-carbon heating going forward. And clearly one of the options which has been tested in Leeds at the moment is whether you use hydrogen in the gas grid. 
And to get the hydrogen, you're likely to use methane and crack it to create hydrogen and then have carbon capture and storage. That is one of the options that's on offer at the moment. It's flagged in the energy strategy. Um, we're going to get to a point sometime in the next few years when we're going to have to make a decision as to whether we go down that, that route or uh, the other route, which is a localised energy system route. And I think that's the, thing, the sort of thing that I would like to have seen more explicitly within the energy strategy, which is these decision points about what are we going to do as a country? Are we going to go down one route, which is going to rely on methane, crack it, use hydrogen in the gas grid as a way of delivering low-carbon heating, or are we going to go down a route which is very different from that around local energy, low-carbon local energy okay. systems? So in one, fracking has no future. Bluntly. In the other, fracking does have a future because actually it will support the methane, the local source of methane, which is then cracked to create the hydrogen. Uh, and that's, I think, a decision which you know, isn't going to be made now, but that's the sort of thing that is flagged in the energy strategy, which, which we need to collectively as a, as a country think about. Okay. Okay. Um Morris Golden was a, a, a final, final supplementary. Just really supplementary. Uh, giving the, the the opposition to fracking from some of the panel members, uh, would they also advocate a closure or a drastic reduction in our oil and gas uh, production from uh, a climate change point of view? Richard Dixon. Um, obviously, the industry talks about a long future, 40 or 50 years for North Sea oil and gas. We would like to see a much shorter uh, future, so not tomorrow, but 10, 15 years. And of course, as part of that, we're already working with the unions to talk about just transition and how we plan, instead of have a crisis where an industry shuts and nothing is there, we plan in a very careful way to make that transition. So working with unions and workers and industry to have jobs for people to go to. And the North Sea industry is already in crisis, losing lots of jobs. So this is the time to be creating those alternatives and to make that transition happen. But clearly, as a country which has very strong climate aspirations, it's going to be morally troublesome if we are very low carbon in future but still producing lots of oil and gas we sell to other people so they can create climate change. OK. OK. Is that content to leave it there? For Greece or Rebecca. Just to flag one thing that hasn't been discussed is the actual emissions from production and refining itself. Um, so the Committee on Climate Change um, did an analysis of the extra emissions that would simply come from the fracking process itself. And without strong regulation to make sure you don't have fugitive emissions, uh, we're talking millions of tonnes of additional CO2. So that means additional millions of tonnes of CO2 that other sectors will have to reduce. So whilst we increase fossil fuel extraction, we have more emissions. That means we'll have to go harder and faster in transport, in buildings, agriculture and everywhere else. I think that's one, one element that's missing in, in all of this is those impacts because especially as we move beyond 2030 and emissions have been drastically reduced, those residual emissions become quite important. And when we're facing difficult decisions in other sectors, we need to think about the long-term uh, impacts and what we're locking ourselves into as we, we head to 2050. Um, thank you very much for your time this morning. I think that's been very, very useful. I hope you found it useful. Um, I'm going to suspend briefly. We'll resume in five minutes.
Okay. Uh, good morning and welcome back to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. The third agenda item is for the committee to consider two petitions. Uh, we will consider these in turn, starting with PE 1601 on European beavers in Scotland. The uh, committee considered this petition at its meeting on the 25th of October 2016 and agreed to write to the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform on the timescales for the decision on the legal status of beavers. The decision to allow the beaver populations to remain in Scotland and to extend protection under the law as a European protected species was intimated to the committee on the 28th of November 2016. The committee has followed up the issue by writing again to the Cabinet Secretary on the timescales for when the protection will come into law as well as to what the interim measures are in place. The petitioner has indicated that he sees no reason for the petition to continue now that a decision has been taken, although he would like the committee to continue to scrutinise this work. Um, I refer members to the papers. Um, can I invite any comments? Andrew, uh, Mark Roscoe. Um, Convener, I mean, I'd, I would be content to close the petition um, in the understanding that you know there, there is an order that will be coming to this committee at some point. Um, what I would like to see is perhaps early sight of the strategic environmental assessment that covers uh, that order when it when it comes to our committee, so that we're aware of um, how the government's considered this as an issue. Well, so we could write to the government along those lines yeah. to indicate we'd like early sight before the petition. Yeah. The um, uh, instrument comes the instrument, to the, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Anyone else? Okay, so are we content to close the petition with the caveats that we just discussed? We are. Okay, we are indeed. Okay, we now turn to petition PE1615 on a state regulated licensing system for game bird hunting in Scotland. This has been referred to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee following scrutiny by the Public Petitions Committee, which had taken evidence on this from stakeholders. Uh, paper 4 outlines the previous scrutiny of the Public Petitions Committee and suggests some possible options available to this committee. Members may, of course, wish to suggest alternative action in relation to the petition. So I, I refer members to the papers and additional evidence received, and I would invite any comments on this issue. In favour of inviting, inviting the petitioner to give evidence to the committee and with a view to then discussing whether we need to invite other stakeholders after that session. Okay. Other views? Uh, Claudia Beamish. Um, thank you, Convener. I take a, a slightly different view um, to, uh, to Kate, but it, it's really in, in view of the fact that we're awaiting information on the European um, research, and I think uh, it might be helpful to write to the Cabinet Secretary and ask when that is going to be coming, and then uh, once there's been a, a brief time for both the petitioner and the range of stakeholders to consider that information, uh, might, in my view, be an appropriate time uh, to invite the stakeholders and petitioner to give evidence. Okay. I'd like to use uh, Alexander Bonnet. Minute. Uh, first, can I note my register of interest relating to shooting? Um, the petition seeks to address wildlife crime, and given a number of ongoing activities on this issue, I'd propose dismissing the petition uh, until such time on these other activities are exhausted. Uh, the committee is still to report back on the wildlife crime report, uh, particularly on the effectiveness of current penalties and investigation protocols. Uh, and I'd also contend that those who shoot are already licensed by the extremely rigorous shotgun and firearms regime. Um, furthermore, vicarious liability introduced just five years ago uh, extends responsibility to those who would require the state licenses being proposed under the petition. So unless the Scottish Government has plans to regulate in this area, I can see no reason to further consider the petition. Uh, I would, however, support Claudia Beamish's uh, intention to write to the Cabinet Secretary to clarify uh, any in further in intentions in this area. So to be clear, are, are you saying we should dismiss the petition or delay consideration of it, just for the record? Uh, I think the petition should be dismissed okay. at this stage. Okay. Other views? Mark Roscoe. Uh, I certainly wouldn't favour dismissing the petition, Kavina. I think there are multiple issues that the petition uh, considers. Wildlife crime is just one uh, narrow aspect of it. Um, I, I would back the call to, uh, to write to the Cabinet Secretary to try and get uh, 
more of a definition of the word shortly, because I think the Cabinet Secretary has indicated that this international research on licensing will be produced shortly. Um, I think, though, that we do perhaps in that letter need to identify uh, an indicative timescale for when this committee uh, will consider this petition. Um, I wouldn't like, like us to get hung up on that definition of shortly. I, I think if we were, for example, ready to go on this in March, uh, that would give the government time to, to respond and hopefully uh, issue the comparative study that's going to be so important in our uh, ongoing understanding of uh, how licensing systems can or cannot work. Okay. I must say I'd be tempted to go along with that myself. Uh, other members? Uh, Angus MacDonald? Yes, yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, I would certainly agree with uh, Mark Ruskell's uh, suggestion. I would certainly be against uh, dismissing the petition at this stage. Um, that would seem to me to be extremely unfair um, and also clearly to write to the Cabinet Secretary for, for further information. You are, of course, a member of the Petitions Committee, Mr MacDonald. I am, yes, I should declare that, yes. Okay. Anyone else got a view? David Stewart? Yeah, just one, uh, Mark Ruskell makes a fair point. I would certainly be totally opposed to closing the petition at this stage and I think uh, it's certainly useful to write to the Cabinet Secretary as well. Along the lines that were discussed. Can I invite other views? Because there's a, 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 you know, a divergence of opinions here. Emma Harper. Contact me about issues around this. So I am in favour of exploring it further and uh, either you know, inviting the petitioner and or other stakeholders in the future to explore this further. OK. One last point. That, um, in terms of inviting people here, I mean, the reason behind that is because I'm keen to give this uh, the attention I think it deserves, but I would support the time frame that Claudia Beamish should set out. Okay, so essentially, uh, to encapsulate this, we have two proposals. One is to dismiss the petition uh, completely at this stage. The other is to write to the Scottish Government seeking information with a view to informing the committee, um, inviting the petitioner and potentially the stakeholders in front of us at a future date, uh, but not too far in the future. Does that summarise the the two options? I think, uh, given the mood of the committee, then it would be sensible for, for us as a committee to write to the Cabinet Secretary, as everyone agrees, and uh, consider uh, further options thereafter once we have a, uh, a response from the Scottish Government. <coughs> Are we agreed to that? Uh, it's Cory B. Mish. Just highlight um, in, in your final comments uh, that I, I would want also to be sure that we highlight the, the need to receive the information from abroad as soon as possible. Okay. And from previous um, experience, just briefly about um, the um, issue around um, concerns about um, goose numbers, for instance, that I don't think we should be waiting for every country to respond no. before we get that information. I only highlight that because it can be quite a long process, and I think we need, taking up Mark Roskell's point, we do need to act quite quickly. Okay. So are we content to proceed on that basis? I'm looking around the table. We are content. So to summarise, we will write to the Cabinet Secretary uh, seeking the information that uh, we've discussed, uh, working to a time frame that is roughly looking towards March as a, as a point at which the committee will come to firmer conclusions upon the action it, it wishes to take. Is that summary, a good summary of where we're at? Sorry, Finley Carson. Uh, would that encompass information on, on how current legislation is working with regards to the, the outcomes that the petitioner is looking for? Will we get further evidence from the, um, just to regards to, to what's already in place? You mean the measures that uh, Mr Burnett um, highlighted how... Yeah. So in the letter to the government, we should expand uh, and seek their views on how the other measures, like general licensing, etc., yeah, has How, how is the working, current legislation has been implemented. How it's viewed. Yeah. Okay, that seems a reasonable point to me. Have we agreed? Okay, so I think we've agreed a way forward on that. Um, uh, at the next meeting of the committee on the 7th of February. The committee will take evidence from stakeholders on the Scottish Government's draft climate change plan, RPP3, on resource use, the water industry, the public sector, peatlands and land use. The committee will also consider draft letters to the Commission for Parliamentary Reform and to the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee. As agreed earlier, we will now move into private session and I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is closed. <laughs>